say, Jeremy? What's up? What's up, everybody? We're making a video. Be energetic. Go. You need, you need me to do that? Hey. Yeah. Hi. Hey, guys. Hi. What's up? We're making Johnny? a YouTube video. I think we're making a video. We are going to have to start that over. <laughs> What's up guys, today we're making a video. We're gonna show off some really awesome reticulated pythons that have been hatching out here at New England Reptile. We're super excited about how this year started off. And hopefully the wind isn't too bad right now. <laughs> All, All right. right guys, we're gonna, we're gonna look at some cool retics that we made. So how about some pied ball retics? So these are really great because from all the pieds that come through here at NERD, I basically put aside a few pieds that really uh, got me interested and raising some of them and the animals that I raised and I bred ended up producing some of the most fantastic pies I've ever seen. This is this is like a really high white pied so this is very unusual for a lot of uh, pied bald retics. Another thing I want to tell you too is see this there's no flinching so since these guys have been born we've been working on socialization so basically putting some extra time and stuff like that with these guys and basically reassuring them that people are not bad. Uh, I will say the piebald retics that I generally deal with are a bit uh, less trusting. Like you just saw this one when you just turned really quick. So basically, it still has the the, the piebald gene tends to have a little bit more uh, uh, nervousness, and the nervousness basically relates to uh, I'm afraid of you, so I might bite you or nip at you, and they're more reactive, and we have to kind of work at getting rid of that. So, but you know, looking at these animals and not the guinea fowl that's over there. You want to talk more about the guinea fowl? The guinea fowl. Those are guinea fowl, and when they're feeling insecure or whatever, they're going to make a lot of noise. Do you name your uh, chickens? I name some of my chickens, yes. But, but these are so these are piebald retics, and I, I mean these are just these are just fantastic. Why do the why are the, the pieds more um, nervous? Well, it's it's part of the gene, so it's part of the genetics. So if I talk about platinum. Uh, the platinum, which is het leucistic, het ultra ivory, het ivory, that tends to be a little bit uh, more nervous, a little bit less trusting, and the same thing is going on with these piebalds. But I've made a legit effort to keep messing with these on a daily basis, and it's really working now. Because now, like this one right here, who's been played with a lot, is there's no wincing, there's no no nothing, and so basically, it's almost like supportive therapy. But these animals are so intelligent and they're so uh, malleable as far as changing their disposition. And the, and the thing is, I have to present myself in a positive manner where the animal is trusting you and basically realizing that you're not a bad thing. And so as you keep doing this over and over again, you're building these trust, these trust threads. So each little experience collectively goes together into a larger experience and the larger experience is what basically governs this animal and how it behaves every single day. Does any of that make sense to you, Jeremy? Makes a lot of sense. You could have just said he's, he plays with them every day and makes them friendly. So I why mean, don't you tell, tell people, like tell Donnie what it is that we're, we're talking about what I'm doing. So Explain me how petting works. Yeah, how no. petting? Yeah, works. that's what that's, he's trying to do, right? No, no, it's more. No, no, no. There's more uh, to it than like more to it than petting. Yeah, no. that, <laughs> that, 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 there's not. That is not way more than snake. petting. Yeah. So like the whole concept is like we want these animals to be like totally desensitized to being touched uh, in the fairly sensitive places. So like, again, looking at like the front of the head, like to be able to mess around with this that's, and not have the animal danger zone. Yeah, Stuart. That. And the tip of the tail. These are some That's of the most sensitive. Plans. He's making a Mad TV reference. You know, I people love watch our videos Mad don't TV. Know Mad TV. Stuart, Stuart is awesome. <laughs> it's danger zone. We're basically just trying to get these animals to the point where being touched is going to make them react to like literally nothing. Um, you know, we want to dispel that myth. Like the big myth slash truth right now is that most of the pie balls that exist are just like very defensive. They're very reactive to being touched. So we just want to get them to a place where I can do this. And that animal is not flick. gonna. See that yep. long tongue flick? That's it, right there. That means that that snake is pretty much already there. Remember, these animals get big, so they're ultimately, you I'm know, you, this this animal could easily, you know, if we really push it, and that's a female, that could be a 16 foot snake. You want that to be friendly, I'd imagine. I do, because at the point, a 16 foot animal's teeth are substantial, mm -hmm. and that can inflict a, a painful bite and injury. And uh, I pretty much don't like to get whaled by my snakes. And all this time I've been doing this, I've really been able to avoid uh, really gnarly uh, inflicted wounds. And that's He's important. not even lying about that. That's He's not. That's Kevin doesn't get bit. Right. He does not get bitten. It's not as exciting though. You know, I got bit by a porphyrisia today. 
Nina took over. Oh, yeah, her rat's One nest. One of the things just like going mental. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. I actually calmed it down. But, uh, that you know, it's just, it's just funny because that animal's brain is definitely on the microscopic size. <laughs> Are you saying that snake's stupid? It's, it's very reactive. It, it's, it's one of those animals that just reacts. It's a sub, it's like a fossorial snake where it spends a lot of time underground and away from people. So when it's just out in the open, it's incredibly reactive. When you put it in light, being largely nocturnal, all those different things, there's too many triggers. Okay, so we're gonna look at, this is a citrus albino. This is the lavender citrus albino. So I have the citrus gene, and that's a nerd gene from an original wild caught animal that looked kind of like a platinum, and it pretty much appeared dominant. So I bred this into my albino line, but what you notice, this orange on here is more saturated than my normal albinos, and it makes for some really cool stuff, and I often forget about my citrus albinos in my collection, and I don't even really necessarily make a whole ton of them, but I should because uh, it really makes a beautiful albino. Keep Talk to some other uh, retech keepers like um, Aubrey Pruitt and, and people like that. They actually, they see it, uh, Gavin Bo. Uh, so show them that one. So that's a purple albino, golden child, me tiger. And this is actually going into a shed. But this orange saturation, yeah, this is going into a shed, sadly. This animal just just ate. So you see that? Reaction. Reaction. You just wanna so it's it's got smell of, of the rodent. Now it's oh this yeah. is this is just I'm losing oh. my mind. I just ate a ate a mouse. Thumbnail material. Oh. oh yeah. Help! Help! So if I go real flat underneath. But this is this this animal is actually this is uh, just you're you're basically it, it actually it's a little bit of urea so it, it peed itself because it literally is just uh, it's it's afraid it just ate normally wants to be quiet I uh, unknowingly pulled some snakes out of the racks I pulled this animal out not exactly realizing that this animal had just fed but back to this is a purple albino and a golden child with the citrus albino gene, and it makes a really, really orange, awesome snake. Are you gonna work with a snake to make it not do that? It, it actually normally wouldn't even do that. <laughs> we're, we're just, so if I, if, <laughs> he's just, I'm losing my mind. So at this point, you have an animal that's incredibly defensive, and it can no longer kind of like assess things, so you gotta kind of bring down its stress. So generally right now is, you know, you, you might want to do, some, like I'm touching it, now it's eyes just move, so now it's starting to think, and it's still assessing things. There's not a lot of tongue movement, so it's not doing a lot, so it's still trying to figure things out. It's still very defensive and more inclined to bite. There's a lot. Let's just look at a whole bin of retics. Do you keep all your retics in these all the time? Please don't think I keep retics in these little bins like this. It's, I'm using this to move them. And uh, each one of these actually has its own uh, cage. Here's an ocelot retic. So both of these are the, the ocelot retic, and these are wonderful. This is a recessive gene. They're, they're so silly. This is, it looks almost like it's a hybrid between a reticulated python and a Burmese python. But this is uh, one of the hottest things to happen to reticulated pythons in a long time. And uh, it's part of a project I work with my buddy Aubrey Pruitt. Really cool. Jeremy's gonna you, you, you're not afraid, are you? No. Okay. No. I don't want you to be afraid. Yeah, you're not afraid. afraid. You're not afraid? No. Okay, so let's say I look at, here's a super phantom retic. And here, black golden child retic. And I, I love the black golden child stuff. It, it just, it's so exquisite. Black and shiny and blue and just when these grow a little bit bigger, they're amazing. And the Super Phantom is our classic blue-eyed leucistic. Uh, somebody might want to notice on the very top of that retex head, you see that little thing, Donnie? Yeah. So what they do, retex, uh, they'll often do this way worse. They'll actually rub the top of their head against their cage as they're constantly moving around their cage, investigating things. So if I walk into a room and I bring any rodents, what they'll do a lot of times that initiates uh, hunting activity or movement of these animals and they'll start moving around the cage and ultimately the cage is ventilated so there's all these little air holes in the plastic top and uh, they'll 
bump their head, bump their head, bump their head, and they'll basically uh, harm the, uh, the exterior part or the waxy uh, sheath of that scale and they'll damage it. So you'll often see retics. If we look at this little retic right here, right there, you'll see that. that that's just a wear and tear of being a baby uh, reticulated python. This is part of what they do. But the good side is reticulated pythons have fantastic healing power. And uh, they'll get through that. And as they uh, grow and they get older, they kind of get their stuff together. And a lot of times, all that goes away. They'll often rub their, their faces too. Uh, and that's as they're once again looking for food and they'll jam their face into a corner. I'm only basically explaining this because people, they might not know because a reticulated python is very different than a ball python. They act completely different. So these are important things to know. But look how wonderful they are. Long tongue flicks. Very, very sweet animals. Uh, super phantoms. I love, uh, sometimes people throw around uh, some kind of thing that super phantoms don't live. That's nonsense. Super phantoms absolutely live. Uh, they're a smaller growing reticulated python, as are the golden childs. And then we start mixing other locality, smaller growing mutations in there. We, we start having reticulated pythons that have uh, or more reduced size potential as an adult. And uh, once again, with reticulated pythons, if I really want to make a reticulated python really big, I'll increase the food opportunities as often as possible and I'll get maximum growth to their size potential. If I don't want to do that and I am a bit conservative and I raise these guys a little bit slower, a little less food opportunities and also reducing the size of the food item, they're going to grow at a far more manageable rate. And that is very applicable with all sorts of different, you know, uh, larger growing animals. Just because a monitor could grow six or eight foot does not mean that it has to grow six or eight foot and under your care it doesn't have to grow six or eight foot uh, and you can uh, keep the size down. Another thing too, obese reptiles are not healthy reptiles. Obesity is going to shorten their lives, it's going to uh, give them fatty liver disease, they're going to die, they're going to have uh, heart attacks and it's just you know something that people don't necessarily understand. They think just because it eats it that means it's good. No. These animals were giving them massive food opportunities where they're not crawling around endlessly looking for stuff and they have a pretty easy life in captivity if you're a good keeper and your husband is spot on and we need to watch what we're actually feeding them. How do I identify a, a fat snake? You want to talk about that? Uh, bait wall, it, you can just generally visually looking at them. Like if you're an accomplished keeper like myself or Jeremy. What if you're me? Uh, like how do I tell? Well, we're teaching you. Well, how do I tell and the snake's fat? Love daddy. What? <laughs> how do I no. tell? How do, how do you know? Yeah, how do I know? I think you might, you've seen a lot of our snakes uh -huh. and you can, you get an idea of what I think is a healthy snake. And if I threw this big fat corn snake, there's a big fat corn snake I've been seeing lately going around on the internet. And that snake is grossly obese. You want to have a nice taper down by the vent. So if you have the body right at the vent and then big massive thing and then quickly tapers, a lot of times that is really like a great indicator of a seriously obese animal. Here's a little cowrie tick. This is a special cowrie tick because this animal comes from the calico lineage and this is going to do something different. This is going to, as it starts showing its paradoxing, is going to show it in a different manner. And uh, so it starts out with this, which is very unusual for a cowrie tick to start doing that. So that brown thing's the paradox? Yes, this starts right there. That's, that's key. That is not normal. And cowrie ticks, if uh, people are just don't know much about uh, reticular, a good snag, yeah. Donnie. So, got a little bit of everything. Just looking at it, make it stop. Yeah, just looking at it. <laughs> they have, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not, they have separation anxiety. It's terrible. Oh, you were kidding, huh? No, I'm not even joking. Wow. You just let them know that you're there and it's, it's ridiculous. So, Casper, Brian Barchex. Snake, Casper, is yeah. from me. It's one of the snakes I produced. Mm -hmm. And it's a black-eyed leucistic. And Brian loves Casper. So if you haven't ever seen Casper, Casper is a big adult leucistic, reticulated python. It's a black-eyed leucistic. So see how that, see how this one has black eyes, right? And if I shine a flashlight in there, it's actually a red pupil. And my blue-eyed ones will have a blue eye, but they also have a red pupil too. Just go look at them for a second. But you can see this. So we have, this is uh, probably has to do greatly with the genetics involved on these two animals. But to me, this is uh, one of my greatest accomplishments ever is the creation of the cowrie ticks. And uh, 
they're just unbelievable to me. And they're always gonna be changing. Uh, very, very sweet animals, generally under my uh, care, whatever. I mean, our cowrie ticks are some of our sweetest they snakes. some of the best. If I had probably 30 cowrie ticks as adults, I think I'd be thrilled because each one of them is unique and each one of them has something that I'm gonna zero in on and that is uh, really enjoyable. Leave, leave comments, comment. guys. We want to hear what you have to say. We are trying to read the comments and see what you guys have to say. We have all sorts of cool new video ideas and don't think we're not trying to get these videos done. Donnie's working big time to get the stuff done. And we really, really appreciate your support. We're trying to build a, a good channel and uh, we, I, I really like having some of the, the, our subscribers that really that leave such great comments. And I just want to tell you guys, I really appreciate your nice words. There's so many people that are kind. And uh, Leah, we love Leah Voon. Leah, you know, I'm doing this to kind of like, I want to teach you guys. I want to make your knowledge special. I want to take the weird kind of ideas that I have and pass some of it on there so you, are, you actually get something unique out of it. And maybe you're going to look at your reptiles or your friend's reptiles in a different light. Even if you don't even like reptiles or keep reptiles, I want you to learn about them because I love animals and I'm very uh, keen on the natural world. All right, guys, so we're going to start this new segment in our videos called Question of the Week. And basically, we're going to ask you a question every week, and we're going to pick our favorite comment uh, and all the responses that you guys give, and we're going to send you guys some cool nerd stickers. So I want to know this week, we just showed you guys some awesome reticulated pythons. I really love these pieds with the white heads. So I want to know from you what your favorite reticulated python mutation is. Comment down below, and we're going to pick, I don't know, whichever one our favorite is. So like something cool.